that academic department has history, history. 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 and uh, classical, classical studies. studies. saying that they're, they don't have an ideology, I mean, like, they don't, like, articulate any. It's non-denominational. Yeah. In that, it's Ecumenical. Yeah. Yeah. Not so much like anti-ideology yeah. as they are. Well, no, I mean, they, I think that that's there, but that that's not, arti you know, n nothing is articulated. There. For mess hall, they're not, like, trying to be the modern in any way. Right, right. right. Space. Have you guys dealt with who is this professor on campus? David Schweikart? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. He was invited to the event because he said he knew everyone at Trump. <laughs> and then what about Peter who does? He's he is teaching. Oh he's teaching in the evening. Mm -hmm. Who was the other one? Lauren? Lauren Langman? Yeah. I didn't talk to him. Do you know her? I know him, yes. Oh, him. I don't know who this person is. He was at Left Forum. Oh, really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, he was at the, the <coughs> thing that I did in Boston, too, the, um, the conference of social theory forum in, in Boston a couple weeks ago. Who is? What about, now. what about the guy that we met? Who? Yeah, he was at the Boston thing, too. Yeah. The one who spoke about Freud. Mm -hmm. Did anyone invite him? He was invited. He was invited. He was All right. Amazing on stage as well. And we announced the event, too. Yeah, we did. Yeah. All right. So I guess we can get started, then. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to talk for, I don't know, about 25 minutes or something. Um, I've got like a prepared presentation on Adorno, including this reading that we'll be doing. Um, and so I'm just going to sort of launch into it, and then, and then we can open it up for discussion. Um, all right, so the title of this talk is Adorno's Political Relevance. Um, and uh, let's, see, let's just get started. Adorno, who was born in 1903 and lived until 1969, has a continuing purchase on problems of politics on the left today by virtue of his critical engagement with two crucial periods in the history of the left, the 1930s old left and the 1960s new left. Adorno's critical theory spanning this historical interval of the mid 20th century can help make sense of the problems of the combined and ramified legacy of both periods. Adorno is the key thinker for understanding 20th century Marxism and its discontents. The period of Adorno's lifetime, coming of age in the 1920s, in the wake of the failed international anti-capitalist revolution that had opened in Russia in 1917, and continued but was defeated in Germany, Hungary, and Italy in 1919, and living through the darkest periods of fascism and war in the mid 20th century to the end of the 1960s, profoundly informed his critical theory. As he put it in the introduction to the last collection of his essays he edited for publication before he died, he sought to bring together philosophical speculation and drastic experience. Adorno reflected on his drastic historical experience through the imminent critique, the critique from within, of Marxism. Adorno thought Marxism had failed as an emancipatory politics but still demanded redemption, and that this could be achieved only on the basis of Marxism itself. Adorno's critical theory was a Marxist critique of Marxism, and as such reveals key aspects of Marxism that had otherwise become buried as a function of the degeneration Marxism suffered from the 1930s through the 1960s. Several of Adorno's uh, writings from the 1930s to the 1940s through the 1960s illustrate the abiding concerns of his critical theory throughout this period. In the late 1920s, the director of the Frankfurt Institute for Social Research and friend and mentor to Adorno, Max Horkheimer, wrote an aphorism titled The Little Man and the Philosophy of Freedom that is an excellent conspectus on the politics of Marxism. 
So I'd like to I'd like us to sort of look at this now. Um, it starts on page 50 of the handout. Um, the Little Man and the Philosophy of Freedom. In what book is this in? It's in Damarung, which oh. is uh, translated as Dawn and Decline. In socialism, freedom is to become a reality. But because the present system is called free and considered liberal, it is not terribly clear what this may mean. Yet anyone who keeps his eyes open and has a little money in his pocket actually has ample occasion to familiarize himself with this concept. He may, for example, ask an acquaintance for a job in his firm. That has nothing to do with philosophy. But his acquaintance knits his brow and says that that is objectively impossible. Business is bad, he says, and he's even been obliged to let many employees go. The man should not be angry with him, for it is not within his power. His freedom does not extend that far. The businessman is subject to laws which neither he nor anyone else nor any power with such a mandate created with purpose and deliberation. They are laws which the big capitalists and perhaps he himself skillfully make use of, but whose existence must be accepted as a fact. Boom, bust, inflation, wars, and even the qualities of things and human beings the present society demands are a function of such laws, of the anonymous social reality, just as the rotation of the earth expressed the laws of dead nature. No single individual can do anything about them. Bourgeois thought views this reality as superhuman. It fetishizes the social process. It speaks of fate and either calls it blind or attempts a mystical interpretation. It deplores the meaninglessness of the whole or submits to the inscrutability of God's ways. But in actuality, all those phenomena which are either experienced as accidental or given a mystical interpretation depend on men and the way they arrange their social existence. They can therefore also be changed. If men consciously took their life in society in hand and replaced the struggle of capitalist enterprises by a classless and planned economy, the effects the process of production has on human beings and their relationships could also be understood and regulated. What today appears as a fact of nature in the private and business dealings of individuals are the effects of social life as a whole. They are human, not divine products. Because these effects of life and society are present but not conscious, willed, or controlled, and are the result of an equal number of individual wills that grasp neither their dependence nor their power, the limitation on individual freedom in our time is, imme is immeasurably greater than would be necessary given the available means. When the businessman whom his acquaintance asks for a job refuses because conditions don't permit it, he thinks he is referring to something purely objective and totally anonymous, reality itself. Since everyone else, including the petitioner, feels the same um, because the reality they themselves created through their social activity appears as something alien by which they must abide, it follows that there are many agents but no conscious and therefore free subjects of social conditions. Men must submit to conditions they themselves constantly create as to something alien and overwhelmingly powerful. Insight is not enough, of course, to change the state of affairs, for the error is not that people do not recognize the subject, but that the subject does not exist. Everything, therefore, depends on creating the free subject that consciously shapes social life. And this subject is nothing other than the rationally organized socialist society which regulates its own existence. In the society as it now is, there are many individual subjects whose freedom is severely limited because they are unconscious of what they do. But there is no being that creates reality, no coherent ground. Religion and metaphysics claim that such a ground exists. In so doing, they try to keep men from creating it through their own efforts. Of course, the present lack of freedom does not apply equally to all. An element of freedom exists when the product is consonant with the interest of the producer. All those who work, and even those who don't, have a share in the creation of contemporary reality, but the degree of that consonance varies considerably. Those for whom it is high seem responsible for reality in a sense. They speak of our reality as if they were royalty, and rightly so, for although they did not themselves create the world, one cannot but suspect that they would have made it exactly as it is. It suits them perfectly that the pr production and preservation of reality in our society proceed blindly. They have every reason to approve of the product of this blind process and therefore support all legends concerning its origin. But for the little man who is turned down when he asks for a job, because objective conditions make it impossible, it is most important that their origin be brought to the light of day 
so that they did not continue to be unfair, unfavorable to him. Not only his own lack of freedom, but that of others as well, spells his doom. His interest lies in the Marxist clarification of the concept of freedom. The quote-unquote Marxist clarification of the concept of freedom that Horkheimer calls for is the usually neglected aspect of Marxism. Marxism is usually regarded as an ideology of material redistribution or social justice, championing the working class and other oppressed groups, where it should be seen as a philosophy of freedom. There is a fundamentally different problem at stake in either regarding capitalism as a materially oppressive force, as a problem of exploitation, or as a problem of human freedom. The question of freedom raises the issue of possibilities for radical social historical transformation, which was central to Adorno's thought. Whereas by the 1930s, with the triumph of Stalinist and social democratic reformist politics in the workers' movement on the defensive against fascism, Marxism had degenerated into an ideology merely affirming the interests of the working class. Marx himself had started out with a perspective on what he called the necessity of the working class's own self-abolition. Marx inquired into the potential overcoming of historical conditions of possibility for labor as the justification for social existence, which is how he understood capitalist society. Marx's point was to elucidate the possibilities for overcoming labor as a social form. But Marx thought that this could happen, could only happen in and through the working class's own political activity. How was it possible that the working class would abolish itself? Mahatma Gandhi said, be the change you want to see in the world. This ethic of prefiguration, the attempt to personally embody the principles of an emancipated world, was the classic expression of the moral problem of politics in service of radical social change in the 20th century. During the mid-20th century Cold War between the liberal democratic West, led by the United States, and the Soviet Union, otherwise known, more accurately, as the Union of Workers' Councils Socialist Republics, because that's what it means, the contrasting examples of Gandhi, leader, leader of nonviolent resistance to British colonialism in India, and Lenin, leader of the October 1917 Bolshevik Revolution in Russia, and of the international communist movement inspired by it, was widely used to pose two very different models for understanding the politics of emancipation. One was seen as ethical, remaining true to its intentions, while the other was not. Why would Adorno, like any Marxist, have chosen Lenin over Gandhi? Adorno's understanding of capitalism, what constituted it and what allowed it to reproduce itself as a social form, informed what he thought would be necessary in theory and practice to actually overcome it in freedom. Adorno, as a Marxist critical theorist, followed, in his understanding, the discussion by Leon Trotsky, who had been the 26-year-old leader of the Petersburg Soviet or Workers' Council during the 1905 revolution in Russia, of the prerequisites of socialism in his 1906 pamphlet, Results and Prospects, where he wrote about the problem of achieving what he called socialist psychology as follows. This is Trotsky. Marxism converted socialism into a science, but this does not prevent some Marxists from converting Marxism into a utopia. Many socialist ideologues, ideologues in the bad sense of the word, those who stand everything on its head, speak of preparing the proletariat for socialism in the sense of it being morally regenerated. The proletariat, and even humanity in general, must first of all cast out its old egoistical nature, and altruism must become predominant in social life, etc. As we are as yet far from such a state of affairs, and human nature changes very slowly, socialism is put off for several centuries. Such a point of view probably seems very realistic and evolutionary and so forth, but as a matter of fact, it is really nothing but shallow mor moralizing. It is assumed that a socialist psychology must be developed before the coming of socialism. In other words, that it is possible for the masses to acquire a socialist psychology under capitalism. One must not confuse here the conscious striving toward socialism with socialist psychology. The latter presupposes the absence of egotistical motives in economic life whereas the striving towards socialism and the struggle for it arise from the class psychology of the proletariat. However many points of contact there may be between the class psychology of the proletariat and classless socialist psychology, nevertheless a deep chasm divides them. 
The joint struggle against exploitation engenders splendid shoots of idealism, comradely solidarity, and self-sacrifice. But at the same time, the individual struggle for existence, the ever-yawning abyss of poverty, the differentiation in the ranks of the workers themselves, the pressure of the ignorant masses from below, and the corrupting influence of the bourgeois parties do not permit these splendid shoots to develop fully. For all that, in spite of his remaining philistinely egoistic, and without his exceeding in human worth the average representative of the bourgeois classes, the average worker knows from experience that his simplest requirements and natural desires can be satisfied only on the ruins of the capitalist system. The idealists picture the distant future generation which shall have become worthy of socialism exactly as Christians picture the members of the first Christian communes. Whatever the psychology of the first proselytes of Christianity may have been, we know from the Acts of the Apostles of cases of embezzlement and of communal property, in any case, as it became more widespread, Christianity not only failed to regenerate the souls of all the people, but itself degenerated, became, became materialistic and bureaucratic. From the practice of fraternal teaching one of another, it changed into papalism, from wandering beggary into monastic parasitism. In short, not only did Christianity fail to subject to itself the social conditions of the milieu in which it spread, but it was itself subjected by them. This did not result from the lack of ability or the greed or th of the fathers and teachers of Christianity, but as a consequence of the inexorable laws of dependence of human psychology upon the conditions of social life and labor, and the fathers and teachers of Christianity showed this dependence in their own persons. If socialism aimed at creating a new human nature within the limits of the old society, it would be nothing more than a new edition of moralistic utopias. Socialism does not aim at creating a socialist psychology as a prerequisite to socialism, but at creating socialist conditions of life as a prerequisite to socialist psychology. In this passage, Trotsky expressed a view common to the Marxism of that era, which Adorno summed up in a 1936 letter to his friend and mentor, Walter Benjamin, as follows. The proletariat is itself a product of bourgeois society. The actual consciousness of actual workers has absolutely no advantage over the bourgeois, except interest in the revolution, but otherwise bears all the marks of mutilation of the typical bourgeois character. We maintain our solidarity with the proletariat instead of making of our own necessity a virtue of the proletariat, as we are always tempted to do. The proletariat which itself experiences the same necessity and needs us for knowledge as much as we need the proletariat to make the revolution, a true accounting of the relationship of the intellectuals to the working class. Adorno's philosophical idea of the non-identity of social being and consciousness, of practice and theory, of means and ends, is related to this, what he called the priority or preponderance of the object. Society needs to be changed before consciousness. Adorno's thought was preceded by Georg Lukács' treatment of the problem of reification or reified consciousness. Citing Lenin, Lukács wrote on the standpoint of the proletariat, the third section of his 1923 essay, Reification and the Consciousness of the Proletariat, that reification is the necessary immediate reality of every person living in capitalist society. It can be overcome only by constant and constantly renewed efforts to disrupt the reified structure of existence by concretely relating to the concretely manifested contradictions of the total development by becoming conscious of the imminent meanings of these contradictions for the total development. But it must be emphasized that the structure can be disrupted only if the imminent contradictions of the process are made conscious. Only when the consciousness of the proletariat is able to point out the road along which the dialectics of history is objectively impelled, but which it cannot travel unaided will the consciousness of the proletariat awaken to a consciousness of this process. And only then will the proletariat become the identical subject-object of history whose praxis will change reality. If the proletariat fails to take this step, the contradiction will remain unresolved and will be reproduced by the dialectical mechanics of history at a higher level in an altered form and with increased intensity. It is in this that the objective necessity of history consists. The deed of the proletariat can never be more than to take the next step in this process. Whether it is decisive or episodic depends on the concrete circumstances of this ongoing struggle. Lukács thought that, as he put it, Lenin's achievement, 
is that he rediscovered the side of Marxism that points the way to an understanding of its practical core. His constantly reiterated warning to seize the next link in the chain with all one's might, that link on which the fate of the totality depends in that one moment, his dismissal of all utopian demands, his relativism and his real politique, all these things are nothing less than the practical realization of the young Marx's thesis on Feuerbach. In his third thesis, thesis on Feuerbach, Marx wrote that the materialist doctrine concerning the changing of circumstances and upbringing forgets that circumstances are changed by men and that it is essential to educate the educator himself. This doctrine must therefore divide society into two parts, one which is superior to, soci to society. The coincidence of the changing of circumstances and of human activity, or self-changing, can be conceived and rationally understood only as revolutionary practice. So what, for Adorno, counted as revolutionary practice? And what is the role of critical theory, and hence the role of Marxist intellectuals, in relation to this? In his 1936 letter to Benjamin, Adorno pointed out that if one legitimately interprets technical progress and alienation in a, in a dialectical fashion, without doing the same in equal measure for the world of objectified subjectivity, then the political effect of this is to credit the proletariat directly with an achievement which, according to Lenin, it can only accomplish through the theory introduced by intellectuals as dialectical subjects. The extremes touch me, but only if the dialectic of the lowest has the same value as the dialectic of the highest. Both bear the stigmata of capitalism. Both contain elements of change. Both are torn halves of an integral freedom to which, however, they do not add up. It would be romantic to sacrifice one to the other, as with that romantic anarchism which places blind trust in the spontaneous powers of the proletariat within the historical process, a proletariat which is itself a product of bourgeois society. This conception of the dialectic of the extremes was developed by Adorno in two writings of the 1940s, Reflections on Class Theory and Imaginative Excesses. In these writings, Adorno drew upon not only Marx and the best in the history of Marxist politics, but also their critical theoretical digestion by Lukács. In his 1920 essay on class consciousness, Lukács wrote that only the consciousness of the proletariat can point to the way that leads out of the impasse of capitalism. As long as this consciousness is lacking, the crisis remains permanent. It goes back to its starting point, repeats the same cycle, until after infinite sufferings and terrible detours, the school of history completes the education of the proletariat and confers upon it the leadership of mankind. But the proletariat is not given any choice. As Marx says, it must become a class not only as against capital, but also for itself. That is to say, the class struggle must be raised from the level of economic necessity to the level of conscious aim and effective class consciousness. The pacifists and humanitarians of the class struggle, whose efforts tend, whether they will or no, to retard this lengthy, painful, and crisis-ridden process, would be horrified if they could but see what sufferings they inflict on the proletariat by extending this course of education. But the proletariat cannot abdicate its mission. The only question at issue is how much it has to suffer before it achieves ideological maturity, before it acquires a true understanding of its class situation and a true class consciousness. Of course, this uncertainty and lack of clarity are themselves the symptoms of the crisis of bourgeois society. As the product of capitalism, the, pro the proletariat must necessarily be subject to the modes of existence of its creator. This mode of existence is inhumanity and reification. No doubt the very existence of the proletariat implies criticism and the negation of this form of life. But until the objective crisis of capitalism has matured and until the proletariat has achieved true, true class consciousness and the ability to understand the crisis fully, it cannot go beyond the criticism of reification. And so it is only negatively superior to its antagonist. Indeed, if it can do no more than negate some aspects of capitalism, if it cannot at, at least aspire to a critique of the whole, then it will not even achieve a negative superiority. The reified consciousness must also remain hopelessly trapped in the two extremes of crude empiricism and abstract utopianism. In the one case, consciousness becomes either a completely passive observer, moving in obedience to laws which it can never control. In the other, it regards itself as a power which is able of its own subjective volition 
to master the essentially meaningless motion of objects. In the standpoint of the proletariat that I quoted earlier, Lukács elaborated this further, that there arises what at first sight seems to be the paradoxical situation that this projected mythological world of capital seems closer to consciousness than does the immediate reality. But the paradox dissolves as soon as we remind ourselves that we must abandon the standpoint of immediacy and solve the problem if immediate reality is to be mastered in truth. Whereas mythology is simply the reproduction and imagination of the problem in its insolubility. Thus, immediacy is merely reinstated on a higher level. Of, co of course, the alternative of indeterminism does not lead to a way out of the difficulty for the individual. It is nothing but the acquisition of that margin of freedom that the conflicting claims and irrationality of the reified laws can offer the individual in capitalist society. It ultimately turns into a mystique of intuition which leaves the fatalism of the external reified world even more intact than before, despite having rebelled in the name of humanism against the tyranny of the law. Even worse, having failed to perceive that man in his negative immediacy was a moment in a dialectical process, such a philosophy when consciously directed towards the restructur restructuring of society is forced to distort the social reality in order to discover the positive side. Man as he exists in one of its manifestations, in support of this, we may cite as a typical illustration the well-known passage from Marx's great adversary, the German socialist Ferdinand LaSalle. Quote, there is no social way that leads out of this social situation. The vain effort of things to behave like human beings can be seen in the English labor strikes whose melancholy outcome is familiar enough. The only way out for the workers is to be found in that sphere within which they can still be human beings. Lukács continues, it is important to establish that the abstract and absolute separation, the rigid division between man as thing on the one hand and man as man on the other, is not without consequences. This means that every path leading to a change in this reality is systematically blocked. This disintegration of a dialectical practical unity into an inorganic aggregate of the empirical and the utopian, a clinging to the facts in their untranscended immediacy, and a faith in illusions as alien to the past as to the present is characteristic. The danger to which the proletariat has been exposed since its appearance on the historical stage was that it might remain imprisoned in its immediacy together with the bourgeoisie. In Reflections on Class Theory, Adorno provided a striking reinterpretation of Marx and Engels' Communist Manifesto as a theory of emancipation from history. This is Adorno. According to Marxian theory, history is the history of class struggles. But the concept of class is bound up with the historical emergence of the proletariat. By extending the concept of class to prehistory, theory denounces not just the bourgeois, but turns against prehistory itself. By exposing the historical necessity that had brought capitalism into being, the critique of political economy became the critique of history as a whole. All history is the history of class struggles because it was always the same thing, namely prehistory. This means, however, that the dehumanization is also its opposite. Only when the victims completely assume the features of the ruling civilization will, the, will they be capable of wresting them from the dominant power. Adorno elaborated this further in the aphorism Imaginative Excesses which was orphaned from the published version of Adorno's book, Minima Moralia, Reflections mm -hmm. from Damaged Life, uh, that he wrote between 1944 and 1947. Adorno wrote that, quote, those schooled in dialectical theory are reluctant to indulge in positive images of the proper society, of its members, even of those who would accomplish it. The leap into the future, clean over the conditions of the present, lands in the past. In other words, ends and means cannot be formulated in isolation from each other. Dialectics will have no truck with the maxim that the former justify the latter, that the ends justify the means. No matter how close it seems to come to the doctrine of the ruse of reason, or for that matter, the subordination of individual spontaneity to party discipline. The belief that the blind play of means could be summarily displaced by the sovereignty of rational ends was bourgeois utopianism. It is the antithesis of means and ends itself that should be criticized. Both are reified in bourgeois thinking. Their petrified antithesis holds good for the world that produced it, but not for the effort to change it. Solidarity can call on us to subordinate not only individual interests, but also our better insight. 
Hence the precariousness of any statement about those on whom the transformation depends. This dissident, wholly governed by the end, is today in any case so thoroughly despised by friend and foe as an idealist and daydreamer. Certainly, however, no more faith can be placed in those equated with the means, the subjectless beings whom historical wrong has robbed of the strength to write it, adapted to, te to technology and unemployment, conforming and squalid, hard to distinguish from the wind jackets of fascism. Mm -hmm. Their actual state disclaims the idea that puts its trust in them. Both types are theater masks of class society projected onto the night sky of the future. On the one hand, the abstract rigorist, helplessly striving to realize chimeras, and on the other hand, the subhuman creature whose dishonors who as dishonors progeny shall never be allowed to avert it. What the rescuers would be like cannot be prophesied without obscuring their image with falsehood. At the same time, however, the producers are more than ever thrown back on theory, to which the idea of a just condition evolves in their own medium, self-consistent thought by virtue of insistent self-criticism. The class divisions of society is also maintained by those who oppose class society. Following the schematic division of physical and mental labor, they split themselves up into workers and intellectuals. This division cripples the practice which is called for, but it cannot be arbitrarily set aside. But while those professionally concerned with things of the mind are themselves turned more and more into technicians, the growing opacity of, of capitalist mass society makes an association between intellectuals who still are such with workers who still know themselves to be such more timely than 30 years ago, that is, the time of the 1917 Bolshevik Revolution. Today, when the concept of the proletariat, unshaken in its economic essence, is so occluded by technology that in the greatest industrial country, the United States of America, there can be no question of proletarian class consciousness, the role of intellectuals would no longer be to alert the torpid to their most obvious interests but rather to strip the veil from the eyes of the wise guys. The illusion that capitalism, which makes them its temporary beneficiaries, is based on anything other than their exploitation and oppression. The deluded workers are directly dependent on those who can still just see and tell of their delusion. Their hatred of intellectuals has changed accordingly. It has aligned itself to the prevailing common sense views. The masses no longer mistrust intellectuals because they betray the revolution, but because they might want it and thereby reveal how great is their own need of intellectuals. Only if the extremes come together will humanity survive. A principal trope of Stalinophobic Cold War liberalism in the 20th century was the idea that Bolshevism thought that the ends justify the means in some Machiavellian fact, uh, manner, that Leninists were willing to do anything to achieve socialism. This made a mockery not only of the realities of socialist politics up to that time, but also of the self-conscious relation within Marxism itself between theory and practice, what came to be known as alienation. Instead, Marxism became an example for the liberal caveat, supposedly according to Kant, that something may be true in theory but not in practice. Mm -hmm. Marxist politics had historically succumbed to the theory-practice problem, but that does not mean that Marxists have been unaware of this problem nor that Marxist theory had not developed a self-understanding of what it means to inhabit and work through this problem. As Adorno put it in his 1966 book, Negative Dialectics, the liquidation of theory by dogmatization and thought taboos contributed to the bad practice. The interrelation of both moments of theory and practice is not settled once and for all, but fluctuates historically. Those who chide theory for being anachronistic obey the topos of dismissing as obsolete what remains painful because it was thwarted. The fact that history has rolled over certain positions will be respected as a verdict on their truth content only by those who agree with Schiller that world history is the world tribunal. That's from the Ode to Joy. What has been cast aside but not absorbed theoretically will often yield its truth content only later. It festers as a sore on the prevailing health. This will lead back to it in changed situations. What this meant for Adorno is that past emancipatory politics could not be superseded or rendered irrelevant to the degree to which they remained unfulfilled. A task could be forgotten, but it would continue to task the present. This means an inevitable return to it. 
The most broad-gauged question raised by this approach is the degree to which we may still live under capital in the way Marx understood it. If Marx's work is still able to provoke critical recognition of our present realities, then we are tasked to grasp the ways it continues to do so. This is not merely a matter of theoretical analysis, however, but also raises issues of practical politics. This means inquiring into the ways Marx understood the relation of theory and practice, most especially his own. Adorno thought that this was not a matter of simply emulating Marx's political practice or theoretical perspectives, but rather trying to grasp the, the, relation of, uh, the relationship of theory and practice under changed conditions. This articulated non-identity, antagonism, and even contradiction of theory and practice, observable in the history of Marxism itself, most of all, was not taken to be defeating for Adorno, but was in fact precisely where Marxism pointed acutely to the problem of freedom and capital and how it might be possible to transform and transcend it. Adorno put it this way in a late posthumously published essay from 1969, Marginalia to Theory and Praxis, inspired by his conflicts with both student activists and his old friend and colleague Herbert Marcuse, who he thought had regressed to a romantic rejection of capital. This is Adorno. If to make an exception for once, one risks what is called a grand perspective beyond the historical differences in which the concept of theory and practice have their life, one discovers the infinitely progressive aspect of the separation of theory and practice, which was deplored by the romantics and denounced by the socialists in their wake, except for the mature Marx. As Adorno put it in a 1969 letter to Marcuse, there are moments in which theory is pushed on further by practice. But such a situation neither exists objectively today, nor does the barren and brutal practicism that confronts us here have the slightest thing to do with theory anyhow. In his final published essay, Resignation, which became a kind of testament, Adorno pointed out that even political undertakings can sink into pseudo-activities, into theater. It is no coincidence that the ideals of immediate action, even the propaganda of the deed, have been resurrected after the willing integration of formerly progressive organizations that now in all countries of the earth are developing the characteristic traits of what they once opposed. Yet this does not invalidate the Marxist critique of anarchism. Its return is that of a ghost. The impatience with Marxist theory that manifests itself with its return does not advance thought beyond itself. By forgetting thought, the impatience falls back below it. This passage from Adorno's last published writing is a paraphrase, a direct paraphrase of Lenin, who wrote in his 1920 pamphlet, Left-Wing Communism and Infantile Disorder, that driven to frenzy by the horrors of capitalism, anarchism is characteristic of all capitalist countries. The instability of such revolutionism, its barrenness, and its tendency to turn rapidly into submission, apathy, phantasms, and even a frenzied infatuation with one bourgeois fad or another, Alain Badiou, Gilles Deleuze, Michel Foucault. All of this is common knowledge. Anarchism was not infrequently a kind of penalty for the opportunist sins of the working class movement. The two monstrosities complemented each other. Adorno. Which, which two monstrosities? Anarchism and opportunism. Opportunism in the workers' movement and anarchism. Adorno paralleled Lenin's discussion of the phantasms of non Marxian socialism and uh, defense of a Marxist approach, stating that, quote, thought, enlightenment conscious of itself, threatens to disenchant the pseudo-reality within which actionism moves. Immediately prior to Adorno's comments on anarchism in the same essay, he discussed the antinomy of spontaneity and organization as follows. Pseudo-activity is generally the attempt to rescue enclaves of immediacy in the midst of a thoroughly mediated and rigidified society. Such attempts are rationalized by saying that the small change is one step in the long path towards the transformation of the whole. The disastrous model of pseudo-activity is the do-it-yourself. The do-it-yourself approach in politics is not completely of the same caliber as the quasi-rational purpose of inspiring in the unfree individuals paralyzed in their spontaneity the assurance that everything depends on them. The society that impenetrably, uh, impenetrably confronts people is nonetheless, nonetheless these very same people. The trust in the limited action of small groups 
recalls the spontaneity that withers beneath the encrusted totality and without which this totality cannot become something different. The administered world has the tendency to strangle all spontaneity, or at least to channel it into pseudo-activities. At least this does not function as smoothly as the agents of the administered world would hope. However, spontaneity should not be absolutized, just as little as it should be split off from the objective situation or idolized the way the administered world itself is. Adorno's poignant defense of Marxism was expressed most pithily in the final lines with which his marginalia to theory and praxis concludes that practice appears in theory merely and indeed necessarily as a blind spot, as an obsession with what is being criticized. This admixture of delusion, however, warns of the excesses in which it incessantly grows. Marxism is both true and untrue. The question is how one recognizes its truth and untruth, and the necessity of its being both. And Adorno acknowledged his indebtedness to the best of historical Marxism when he wrote that, the theorist who intervenes in practical controversies nowadays discovers on a regular basis, and to his shame, that whatever ideas he might contribute were expressed long ago, and usually better the first time around. All right. Sorry, I know that was a little bit lengthy. <coughs> in there as I possibly could. <laughs> <clears throat> See, I kind of geared it towards the assumed presence of some mess hall arts. <laughs> oh, the anarchism? Yeah, yeah absolutely. <coughs> absolutely. And prefiguration. Yeah, yeah. be the change. So my basic point is that um, the reason that Adorno might still be with us is that he lived through the last two major periods of the left, the 1930s and the 1960s. Um, and you know, as a figure, his thought is really characterized by the trajectory that unites those two periods, which um, otherwise might you know, be assumed to be very different, very separate. Um, and that uh, you know, his critique of the 60s new left was that it wasn't enough of a departure from the 1930s old left on the one hand, and on the other hand, it was too much of a departure. Meaning it, it didn't depart from what was bad about the old left enough, and it didn't retain what was good about the old left enough. Um, and that, you know, we're haunted by both the 1930s and the 1960s in our political imagination on the left, um, whether it's you know, the perpetual anti-war movement on the one hand, or on the other hand, the New New Dealism, you know, the kind of the fantasy, um, which takes two dimensions. There's a fantasy of reformism, the fantasy of FDR New Dealism, but there's also the fantasy of the threat of fascism. So like every little blip on the right is like fascism. You know, it's like Christian fundamentalism is fascism. Mm -hmm. The Tea Party movement, fascism. Everybody is Hitler. Yeah, right. Um, which is, uh, you know, I thought it parodied pretty well by Glenn Beck dressing as a Nazi on the cover of his book, <laughs> right? Because he's making fun of the liberals who accuse him of being a Nazi. Whereas, I mean, the funny thing is that he thinks that the liberals are Nazis. Right. There's a kernel of truth to that, though. <laughs> right. In other words, he has much right to accuse them of being Nazis as they have the right to accuse him of being Nazi. I think. Um, but you know this imagination still grips us. That's the point, right? Um, I think that uh, who was it? Was it Richard who who discovered um, because he pays attention to these people? Um, I don't know if it was Krugman on some like TV talk show. They were talking about the financial collapse, and he said, "Well, there's no reason for us to become red guards." As if, and it just was kind of came out of nowhere. It's like, well, yeah, there's a financial crisis, but it doesn't mean we have to, you know become red guards. And so, you know, the question is what do we do with this legacy? What do we do with this imagination that still hangs over our social reality? Um, you know, more than 40 years after the 60s, you know, more than 80 years now after the 30s. Um, and uh, this is where 
you know, Adorno has uh, experienced something of a renaissance in the last, um, really in the last 20 years, uh, starting in the 90s. Um, people started um, paying new attention to Adorno and there's been a kind of explosion of commentary on him. Um, what's interesting is the degree to which people avoid his Marxism. It was the degree to which people address Adorno as a political figure, as a political thinker. Um, they assimilate him to liberalism. They you know, kind of domesticate Adorno and turn him into someone who likes diversity and this kind of thing, which of course he did. Um, but they really drop his uh, critique of capitalism. They, they drop his um, understanding of what blocks all the values that we supposedly would like. Um, and you know, my own work, I mean, obviously I'm here speaking on behalf of Platypus, but I also have my academic work, which is um, to reestablish the, the uh, way Marxism informs Adorno's work, because I think that it helps us grasp what Marxism was really about. In other words, I think that it's via Adorno that one can get a, a sense of what um, Marxism intended to be, and uh, that was what was behind the, the reading that um, I did with you guys of uh, Little Man and the Philosophy of Freedom um, that Horkheimer were writing in the late 20s, um, is really, you know, giving a conspectus on Marxism that's quite different from what most people think Marxism is about. Um, and, uh, you know, he uses the example of unemployment, but notice it's not the example of exploitation, right? It's the example of one's position in society, which is a different kind of matter. It's not like a parable about how the worker is exploited by the capitalist. It's a parable about not being able to find a job and you know, facing society as an anonymous reality um, that excludes you. And you know, again, that's not the way people usually think about Marxism. They usually think about Marxism as purely kind of you know, an account of economic exploitation or an account of social oppression that derives from economic exploitation rather than as you know, a profound kind of self-alienation of humanity in which everyone has their freedom constrained, right? It's the employer who's not free to hire the guy, right? It's not only the unemployed guy who's not free, mm -hmm. but the potential employer is also not free. They're both facing objective constraints. Right. And, you know, it's this aspect that, you know, the degree to which Marxism is accepted, it's accepted as some kind of economic critique of capitalism. The degree to which it's ignored, it's as a critique of modern society as alienation, or that alienation is understood as something else, like the division of labor. It's a romantic critique of alienation. It's the idea that we live in, you know, we don't live in an organic society anymore. We don't live in a society of direct relations anymore. It's like that kind of view of What's wrong with capitalism is what capitalism destroyed about traditional society. And of course, that's quite different from Marx. Um, you know, yeah. Marx, who, who um, you know, really thought that it was great that capitalism disrupted traditional society. That it was, that capitalism was a form of freedom for Marx, as well as a form of unfreedom. Can you maybe elaborate a little bit about the two of you invoked? You said the socialist consciousness of the proletariat and the socialist psychology, which I think you were getting at with the socialist psychology. That is like what you would experience under actual socialism. Mm -hmm. And the socialist consciousness is kind of like um, immediate demands of the proletariat. Mm -hmm. Is that kind of just making well, let me clarify that a little bit. I think that, um, you know, it's kind of like this. One is a socialist in politics because one wants socialism, right? Not because one, in, you know, personally inhabits the principles of socialism or embodies the principles of socialism. Um, in other words, um, you know, there's a notion of politics here where we're going to be instruments of the system no matter what we do. No matter what we do, we're going to be instruments of the system. The question is, can we be instruments of the system that advances the system in an emancipatory direction and points beyond the system? That's really the issue. The issue is, you know, you're going to be an instrument of the system. The question is, in what way? 
Um, and so therefore, to say that socialist politics is about the desire for socialism or about recognizing the necessity of socialism because capitalism is so destructive, so self-destructive. And that's different from being able to personally embody the principles of an emancipated society, to have you know, the psychology, <coughs> excuse me, to use Trotsky's language, of um, a person living under socialism. And you know, especially because socialism has not yet ever been achieved. Right, when the word socialism has never been achieved. What's the, the only thing that's ever been achieved is some contingent victory of uh, politicians who claim to want socialism. And, you know, that difference is easily lost sight of, but is a huge difference. Right? To say that, look, the proletariat is just as bourgeois as the capitalists, right? In other words, they're within the system, of course, workers, both individually and collectively, collectively in the form of unions, collectively in the form of nations, are going to look out for their self-interest. Right? Capitalism is a system in which people are pitted against each other in their self-interest. Right? That's just real. And so the real question is, you know, you'd be asking something superhuman of people to deny that, right? The question is, can the workers' struggles in their own self-interest point beyond their self-interest, right? And it's a hypothesis, essentially. In other words, for Marx and for Marxists, the hypothesis is that capitalism as a social system is so self-destructive that people will become tired of it, that people will try to do something to get out of it, which, of course, is a very tricky affair. Right. In other words, you could try to get out of it and end up in, back in it in a, in a worse way or perhaps in something worse than what we have now. Um, but it's, you know, that kind of risk is in the nature of politics. It's in the nature of any kind of political action. Um, and so the idea that you're going to you know, require of people um, a kind of uh, ethical self-reform before the possibility of political action is really to say that it's impossible to change society. Right. The question is, what can people do as they are now to change things? And uh, you know, one of the things that you know, the Marxist left has become this kind of cranky thing. I mean, most especially after 1989, but even for a long time prior to that, um, in the sense that uh, there's been a kind of mystification of the idea of revolution, for example. Um, and uh, so the idea of this kind of radical change and people wanting radical change has become both a banality and kind of a mystified um, prospect. Whereas for the people of an earlier generation around the turn of the century, like people like Lenin, the question of socialist revolution was a practical issue. And it wasn't like com competing utopias the way it is now that the only thing that distinguishes left groups now are sort of competing utopias, not any like actual practical differences over how to get there from here, um, which would be a legitimate form of political differences. Um, and Marxism has degenerated to such a point that a lot of people justify really bad visions of society on the basis of Marxism. I mean, you could point to all sorts of things, the shining path in Peru, the Khmer Rouge, the ruling ideology of any of the uh, post-Soviet states. Um, yeah, uh, most of the left sectarian groups, you know, that if you sort of scratch the surface and you, you, know, you start to get a sense of the social imagination that's informing their activities, um, they've really lost sight of the point um, that the earlier generation, you know, now several generations ago, had which is that they wanted to instrumentalize their own activity in the service of creating an opening for a better society. So with people like Trotsky and Lenin, they wanted to do something to help facilitate, open the door to the working class transforming capitalism. Right, that's how they understood the revolution. The revolution was the beginning of the process. And their politics was just about that beginning, right, that, the issue of taking the next step. Right. And so it was both more radical and more modest 
than we have an easy time imagining. And it's because we get waylaid into these ethical disputes over, you know, proper psychology or something. Mm. Well, I mean, al along those lines then, um, sort of the, 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 the other problem, or sort of a, a sort of another dimension of, of the problem, sort of setting your B to change that you want to see, or the um, prefigurative idea, is this sort of delusion of a kind of self-determination, as though at any moment you can sort of determine your whole personal history and its effects upon you psychologically. Um, and sort of in that respect, I mean, Adorno, I mean, that's sort of an element of Adorno's thought that wasn't emphasized here, which is basically his use and critique of Freud and Freudian categories. Right. So, I mean, how, um, how for Adorno, that's a, an integral part of this uh, as well is, is maybe something you could speak about for a moment. Mm -hmm. And I guess the other question I had would be that um, sort of going from the, the, the somewhat, I, I would take it as uh, necessarily self-parodic end there with saying that, you know, I mean, what sort of, what would you say is the relevance of the fact that Adorno remains relevant and particularly uh, that asserting relevance is sort of already an argument that is beating a path that's already retreated in a certain sense that, um, that I mean, you know, Adorno himself, you close saying, you know, Adorno says it's sort of a tragedy that every time uh, any sort of critic speaks, he sort of recognizes that someone said it before in a better way. Mm -hmm. uh, what does it mean that you, you know, to end a paper with that? Huh. Let me start with that. Okay. Um, and then I'll go back to the other, to the other points. Um, what's interesting about Adorno, and I think what makes him relevant, is that he wasn't original. He wasn't trying to be original. Um, you know, when I was preparing this presentation, as well as in doing my dissertation work, it's, you know, I'm, I always know intuitively from my extensive readings of these figures, but I'm always shocked at just how literally true it is that Adorno is just paraphrasing Lenin and Luxembourg and Trotsky all the time, right? And, you know, he's tweaking it in terms of some of his philosophical categories, but it's pretty thinly veiled, if, if veiled at all. The reason that it's not recognized as such is that people have no clue what the older generation of Marxists were about. Like they have no clue that that um, you know Trotsky's critique of prefigure prefiguration, Lenin's critique of anarchism. They have no clue about its nature, about like the real basis of that thinking, of that politics. And so instead, they chalk up to Adorno some kind of unique insight of his own. Whereas, in fact, he was trying to retain the insight of a historical period that had slipped away and passed into a kind of regressive kind of obscurity. Um, the issue with Freud is more complicated. Um, so in other words, let me just uh, finish the other thought. The relevance of Adorno is also his potential irrelevance. Right? In other words, I find paradoxical the idea that we're in the midst of like an Adorno renaissance and that the nature of that renaissance is to ignore what Adorno is saying. In other words, there's sort of this kind of renewed interest in Adorno and yet there's also a kind of studious... Well, and a renewed interest in Marx generally. Right. Yeah. Marx is a little bit more easy to understand because after all, Marx gave us, you know, the critique of political economy, capital, and people can kind of crack their heads on it and turn the, the pages, uh, you know, 180 <laughs> degrees around and say, oh, how does this apply to the present financial crisis? Yeah, because he actually did like a critique of economic thinking in a way that Adorno never did that because of course he didn't think it was necessary to rewrite Marx. In other words, he always thought you could just refer to Marx for that. Um, and so they tend to think of Adorno as an ethical philosopher. Hmm. And they, think, they tend to think of Marx as an economic philosopher. Mm -hmm. And it's a, a, a parody of both, right, to, to cash it out that way. Um, and so, like I was saying, his potential relevance is also his potential Ill irrelevance. And I find it symptomatic that people return to Adorno, that there seems to be this kind of impulse to return to Adorno, and yet there's also this impulse to kind of rebury Adorno. So there's an impulse to sort of resuscitate, disinter, bring back, but also to sort of more thoroughly bury in the secondary literature. The secondary literature on Adorno from the 70s and 80s was pretty god-awful. But the secondary literature on Adorno today, even though much more academically sophisticated, is actually much worse, um, which is kind of shocking. Um, but anyway. Are they repeating what you've 
security spirits better in a worse way. Well, no, the, the earlier ones did this kind of hack job on Marxism. The new ones just ignore the Marxism. In other words, in the 70s and 80s, people were like, okay, Adorno, there's some relationship between Adorno and Marxism, and let's figure out what that is. And then they pretty much just superimposed their own misunderstanding of Marxism onto Adorno. Now there isn't even that, because nobody even tries to understand Marxism, and so there's not even that kind of attempt. So if, if misunderstandings of, Marxist, of Marx are so widespread today or 30 years ago, and I'm sure you could say 100 years ago too, um, then why would Adorno just refer to Marx but paraphrase Lenin and Trotsky? Because he thought it was more urgent to, um, to disinter the Marxism. In other words, um, I mean, he certainly invoked Marx a lot, but why is he paraphrasing Lenin? Because that's what's in danger of being truly lost. Right, um, I, you know, in something that I published, um, you know, Adorno had this kind of wry comment about how Marx is kind of harmless. Right? In other words, people can kind of accept Marx as kind of harmless, but it's really Lenin. Right? Because Lenin is not harmless, he's the one that needs to be mm. remembered. Mm -hmm. um, and Marx is just a philosopher. Well, because people can do that with Marx. Right. You know, they can kind of, you know, do the selective treatment. There's no doing that with Lenin. Like, you can't turn Lenin into, you know, whatever. Um, some like great analyst of modern society, you know, because Lenin was like 24/7, 365 a year, like revolution, baby, revolution, <laughs> making the revolution, right? Whereas Marx, you know, went to the British Library, you know, took some time off. I mean, Lenin also went to the British Library, but the whole time <laughs> he was like, and what about the revolution? <laughs> right? It's almost like people can like trick themselves into thinking that Marx stopped thinking about the revolution for half a second but they can't trick themselves into believing that about Lenin. Um, so it's, you know, and you know, again, this is the kind of scandalous thing in my dissertation is that the, this kind of, you know, oh, Adorno was a Leninist, but he just was, right? And people just want to ignore that, but it's like, well, but there it is. And so what it should mean in terms of the relevance or relevance question is that uh, people should reconsider what that means. In other words, it could be a yeah. I mean, in other words, you know. It can mean lots of different things. It can mean lots of different things, but really, you know, again, because of the direct paraphrase, um, you know, most people who read Adorno would just spontaneously think that, of course, Adorno and Gandhi, you know. They would. They would be like, well. Adorno and Gandhi? Absolutely. Because they treat Adorno as an ethical philosopher. Even though, like, Adorno is not prefigured. Even though, because doesn't he say, like, there is no good life in the bad Minimum lives? moralia. Yeah. Yeah, a good, yeah, so right life. So like, be, I guess, I don't know, not an ethical philosopher in that sense. Well, they still try to twist it into that. They, uh, you know, in other words, Gandhi talked about how fallen the world was, too. Yeah. Right? Um, like, in other words, Gandhi didn't, wasn't an ethical philosopher in the sense of saying everything was okay, people could be ethical. He rather berated everyone for their ethical shortcomings, and that's the way they read Adorno. They read Adorno as just berating people for their ethical shortcomings. They don't see it as a critique of capital. Right? Um, they see it as more like existentialism or something. You know, wrong life cannot be lived rightly. You know, but they don't connect that to, well, why is that so? You know, is that connected to an understanding of capital? But I wonder if having a greater grasp some kind of background of Marx helps you get to Adorno's character of Lenin. Maybe. Um, I mean, because I think, and the reason I say that is because to me it's like easy to see where you're coming from or even, you know, that that, it's hard to have that perspective since you're so, you're so, you know, beyond being at that kind of starting gate of, of looking at Adorno, you know, mm -hmm. like somebody who is, I mean, because I, you know, I mean, I can even remember a time when I didn't really understand Adorno deeply, and I was, I think, certainly partial to it. It's opaque. It's opaque. I mean, 
Um, again, there's the question of how much Adorno's work relies on a kind of um, Marxian kind of critical theory, like the assumptions of Marx, Marx's own critical theory, like Marx's capital, that kind of stuff, um, which is separable in people's minds from Marx as a politician, Marx mm -hmm. as a, a political activist. And certainly that's like deeply informing Marx, uh, Adorno's work, excuse me. Um, but there's a way in which, and this is you know, where the, the, the uh, kind of life history has to fit into it, which is that Adorno was turned into a Marxist by the Bolshevik Revolution. He didn't just read Marx and thought, this is a good idea. He was, you know, uh, like a lot of people <coughs> of his generation, the only reason he became a Marxist was because of the Bolshevik Revolution. They would never have been Marxists otherwise. Um, in other words, if there had only been the collapse of social democracy in World War I and no Bolshevik Revolution, none of these guys would have been Marxists. Benjamin, Adorno, Horkheimer, Marcuse, they wouldn't have been Marxists. There would have been Heideggerians, they would have been Weberians, they would have been Nietzschean, but they wouldn't have been Marxists. They would have been Kantian, they might have been Hegelian, not Marxists though. And so it begs the question, in other words, why did the Bolshevik Revolution turn people onto Marx? I think that also begs the question of what it means to become a Marxist, like, you know, after 1989. Today. Yeah. It's very tricky. It's very tricky. It's, it's the degree to which we can recognize that we're still living under um, the effects of 20th century history. In other words, the degree to which we can, <coughs> you know, in other words, from a certain standpoint, the 20th century came to an end in 1989. Like, you know, with 1989, the legacy of World War II, the interwar period, World War I, was sort of definitively closed, and now we could just move into a Wilsonian world. In other words, we could just move into the world that the United States always wanted, going back to 1914. The degree to which we haven't been able to do that, right, the degree to which it isn't that neoliberalism didn't just prevail, simply, um, then the question is, okay, well, how are we still living under this, you know, legacy of the 20th century, and how does that legacy relate to capitalism, right? Or is the 20th century just over? Are we just back in the 19th century or something? You know, are we in like the Charles Dickens world, you know, of neoliberalism? You know, more so in this, <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, you would think you know, that we are in back in a new Gilded Age or back in the 19th century in certain respects. Um, and yet, you know, clearly there are, you know, maybe I could get back to, to Nate's point about Freud a little bit. Um, clearly, you know, we still live with 20th century dynamics of um, authoritarianism, you know, which uh, was new. It wasn't really, uh, it wasn't brand new. It wasn't without any precedent. But it's, it's a new feature of the 20th century. It wasn't as prominent in the 19th century, this kind of mass culture, mass society, mass politics, authoritarianism. Um, even if we live under kind of a weak version of it, whether that's understood as the Tea Party phenomenon or Obama mania or whatever, these, this has the character of 20th century authoritarianism. Um, and you know, we are definitively in the, in the realm of uh, mass politics. Um, and so I think that, you know, gets raised as a question, why isn't the world now the way it was supposed to be after the fall of the Soviet Union? Right, because there was a view after the Soviet Union collapse that, okay, it's clear sailing now, um, that we can, you know, that we can live in a world without war and live with, you know, live in a world without, um, you know, too much disparity. In other words, the neoliberal vision starting in the 1970s was a vision of global development. It wasn't a vision of global <coughs> impoverishment. Right? It's why someone like Jeffrey Sachs, who was like an architect of the shock therapy in Eastern Europe, who's a Mil Milton Friedmanite, right? it's why he's now converted to like Keynesian welfare statism, because it didn't work out the way he planned. Like he, his intention was not to like immiserate millions of people. Right, his idea was to free them to participate in capitalism and enrich themselves and you know contribute to the world's wealth, not like write off whole continents 
to absolute despair. Um, and so now he's become, you know, a kind of world philanthropist, you know, advocate of Keynesian economics, right? He's like, oh, I was wrong. <laughs> you know? And so, you know, and like I said, when you look at, you know, the politics of our time, the imagination of it is still very much in 20th century times, the threat of fascism. You know, Sarah Palin was like the threat of fascism. You know, I remember when Dan Quayle was the threat of fascism. <laughs> you know, Ronald Reagan was the threat of fascism. And then, of course, there was just a straight up new leftists who thought LBJ was a fascist and Nixon was a fascist. You know, everybody was a fascist. Um, and, you know, so what do we make of that? And that's where, you know, if we're still using the language of the 20th century, it might mean that the critical theory of the 20th century also applies. And um, the thing with Freud, the use and critique of Freud, I mean, I didn't really get into it because there's a way in which Freud's necessity from Adorno's perspective is itself also a consequence of the failure of Marxism. In other words, it's with the failure of Marxism that one has to attend to the question of psychology um, and the complexities of psychology. Like, why would you have mass movements that are predicated on people acting against their own interests? Right? Because if Freud asks the question of how the neurotic, the individual neurotic, acts against his or her own self-interest, is self-defeating, then you could extrapolate why do whole nations, whole classes of people, act in a paranoid, delusional manner against their own interests. Um, but, you know, in a sense, for instance, Trotsky's notion of psychology, I mean, even though he was aware of and sympathetic to Freud, um, it hardly needed to be particularly complex, mm -hmm. right? In other words, there's like a direct, he's like, well, look, the working class is oppressed. Oppressed people are not going to be particularly altruistic, you know, so don't expect them to be like, you know, the great Christian brotherhood, like that socialism is not the 12 apostles. You know, um, and you know, but that doesn't, you know, even though he was aware of and sympathetic to Freud, that doesn't involve any kind of particular Freudian approach to psychology. It's just straightforward interest psychology. You know, it's rational interest. Um, so that's why I left it out because there's a way in which, um, you know, for Luxembourg or Lenin or Trotsky, or for Marx, they wouldn't have been preoccupied with the notion of like unconscious motivations. They would have seen it as a straightforward matter of people rationally figuring out what's in their interest and struggling as best as they can under present social conditions to advance those interests, encountering new problems, and then overcoming those problems. And so that's why it was always taking the next step, opening the door, advancing a process. They weren't really concerned with the sort of deep structure of how that process would undermine itself, other than as a function of what they called alienation which was really pitched at a more kind of overall societal level, right? It wasn't about the psychology of the capitalists or of the workers. It was about how the social system itself was opaque to the people who were operating within it. I was wondering if you could elaborate on the category of reification and the way that the, 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 the position that plays in like a dialectical overcoming of capitalism and how it like attempts, to, attempts to escape reification or ultimately doomed to failure? I mean, the term reification can be unfortunate because it can appear to be like a kind of closed or homogeneous or kind of one-dimensional kind of category. In other words, that if you say... Wait, how about a definition? Consciousness, oh, reified. To reify is to treat something as a thing that is really a process. In other words, to sort of treat for instance, consciousness as like a mechanism as opposed to something that's subject to transformation and change to some kind of qualitative process. And so very straightforwardly, it's to kind of mechanize something that is more processual. Would that apply to this, the little man, the philosophy <coughs> of freedom, how the, I guess he can't get a job, he does. Business is bad. Yeah. The law of the you know, business cycle, right? In other words, to treat capitalism as a force of nature, the business cycle as a kind of force of nature, is to reify it. As mm -hmm. opposed to recognizing it as this, you know, conglomeration of the, of... People's interests. And this thing produced by man. Mm-hmm. 
as the result of uh, something people's that we all produce, not something that we are all constrained by. Simply subject to. Yeah. I mean, reification is kind of a deep thing, but again, the danger is that once you identify reification as the problem, that it becomes impossible to think how you can get out of it. Um, and so what it demands is a sort of dialectical idea of reification, meaning that reification is both the constraint and the possibility of consciousness of that constraint. In other words, um, another passage from Adorno that I didn't use is um, that in Adorno's elaboration from Marx, the commodity form is not just a constraint on consciousness, but rather is generative of consciousness. In other words, that um, the contradiction of the commodity form is what allows us to be conscious of it, and allows us to be conscious of it in a kind of liminal way, meaning not in an absolute way, but you know, we can have a kind of modicum of awareness of the self-defeating character of our activity under capitalism. So reification, again, it turns into this kind of you know, trapped within the system or something. Um, rather than the way Lukács understood it, which is Lukács understood it as we work through categories of reification and we dissolve the categories of reification as a function of working through them, but working in them. <coughs> or in other words, that you know, it's a kind of Hegelian dialectical notion, which is that the overcoming of reification is also the completion of reification. Right? In other words, to say... So it's the condition of our thinking of our... And of our practice. Our practice. Right, oh, like, it's like commodity. The idea is that the commodity form is, is a form of participation. It's a form of agency. It's a form of subjectivity, both practically and theoretically. And that reification is meant to sort of capture that um, as something that goes beyond um, merely the economic relations. Um, and another way of putting it in terms of reification, well, I mean, the most straightforward way of putting it is this. If the working class is the product of capitalism, and if the goal of emancipation beyond capitalism is to abolish the working class as such, then why would you ever endorse the working class's own political activity in trying to do that? Wouldn't you try to get around it somehow? Like, why would you expect that the most reified expression of society, namely people who have to live by their labor, by the exchange of their labor, directly, and as just pure exchange of their labor, it doesn't matter what they're working on, just pure like, you know, oh, I'm, I'm laid off at, at the Ford plant, okay, I'll go to work at Target. Right, that that's the working class. The working class of the so people. Basically society lives by just the extraction of the hours of their day. Exactly. And so the idea that the most reified aspect of society, the pure abstraction of labor power, would be the means by which you overcome that society. Right, this is the point of departure of Marxism. All other anti-capitalisms imagine that you have to go around or outside it rather than in and through it. Like, there's nothing more reified about capitalism than labor, than wage labor, and the people who live by it. You know, that is the reification of capitalist society. So why would you endorse people who are just trying to realize their wage labor in better ways? namely the workers' movement. Of course, the other thing is we would be simply unifying class just to see it in that respect, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, people do. In other words, there's a reason why the left is so quick to, I mean, look at what LaSalle said about the British workers going on strike. He's like, oh, well, these are just the things asking for their rights as things. Right? And he was a socialist. Right? He was a socialist who read Marx, who admired Marx, who wrote, like, wonderful, like, book reviews of Marx's capital, oh, Marx is a genius, right? And he was a reader of Hegel. And he was against labor unions because he thought, oh, all that labor unions are are the working class asserting their rights as things, not as human beings. They're just, they just want to be better paid cogs in the machine, right? So what he wanted was for the state to, um, you know, reform society, that it wouldn't happen through the workers um, you know, through their kind of uh, political economic activity. So then the question is, okay, well, or Bakunin, I brought up anarchism, right? Bakunin accused Marx of trying to, of wanting to turn the world into a giant factory. In other words, Bakunin's critique of Marx was that Marx was endorsing reification, 
In other words, that he was putting his faith in that which we should be struggling against, namely capitalism. Right? It's because Bakunin couldn't, couldn't have a dialectical conception of capitalism that he came to see Marx that way, that Marx was simply endorsing capitalism, and that if Marx got his way, it would just make capitalism worse. Like it wouldn't be overcoming capitalism, it would be intensifying capitalism. That's what you get from a Noam Chomsky, like Noam Chomsky's critique of Marxism, is that Marxism is the ideology of the coordinator class for the even greater exploitation of the working class than happens under capitalism, right? What Chomsky, like Bakunin or LaSalle, like the difference from of a Marxist approach from their approach is this dialectical conception of capital. In other words, capitalism isn't just bad. It's self-contradictory. Um, and therefore, the reification that's involved in capitalism is not just bad. It's not a pejorative category. <laughs> <coughs> um, even though it sounds like one, and certainly it's used like the people who take it up as cultural criticism, right, use it just as a pejorative negative category. But they don't see it as a precondition for any kind of change. Yeah, you know, like commodity culture, right? So this idea that like, oh, well the culture industry is bad, why? Because it reifies things. You know, advertising, look at how you know, we're surrounded by reified imagery <laughs> of the world. Um, right, as if there were an alternative to that. Because there isn't. That's the point. Like the point <coughs> is... Constant mistake for the is living in advertising or something. Right, or something, <laughs> you know. <coughs> but, you know, the idea that the working class is, like, you know, saturated with consumerism, and like that kind of critique, you know, <coughs> is beholden to reification. Well, how else are workers supposed to live other than by consuming? You know, like, the workers mm -hmm. don't have a choice. They have to go to Walmart and they have to buy shit that's manufactured on, on all corners of the world. Like, the working class as such, people who have to live by their labor, they can't go out and garden, you know, sew their own clothes and this kind of nonsense. Absolutely not. The only way that they can live is through reification. And the petty bourgeois can do that shit and carry around their Guatemala bags. <laughs> yeah. um, so, I mean, that's, that's really what's at issue. I mean, let me go back to another point of Nate's, uh, the first part of Nate's question, which is the idea of prefiguration, or the idea of a prefigurative politics, and how that is understood as true autonomy, right, or self-determination. Um, and, you know, the question is, well, again, for whom, in what way is that self-determination? In other words, um, you know, we do live in a kind of thoroughly kind of uh, ethical kind of rejection of capitalism. Like that's what the left is degenerate, degenerated into. So the idea is that you withdraw from consumer society you know, you withdraw into community-based, you know, economies and localism. And that in so doing, you're asserting your self-determination, right? Now, first of all, that reifies the system as if the system is outside of you, as if it's out there, as if it's not driven by the form of subjectivity that has given birth to you, has given rise to your own consciousness. Um, and, you know, it's a non-starter at the level of actual social change. I mean, that's the other thing. Self-determination for whom and in what way. It might be some kind of marginal self-determination, the way Trotsky put it. Um, no, in fact, it was the way Lukács put it, um, the, the enclaves of immediacy. Um, like, in other words, that because of the contradictions within the system, people can find their little openings here and there for their autonomous existence. But that's not going to change the system. In other words, that's what the system can allow for, but it's not going to change it, unless you take this idea that it's going to change the system gradually. Like the more and more people do that, the more the system will change. Well, people have had this idea for more than 150 years, and it hasn't happened yet. My point is, if Marxism hasn't happened yet, 
it should at least get an equal hearing to the stuff that also hasn't happened yet. Um, in other words, that there's a there's a point to you know disrupting <coughs> the bad utopianism um, in favor of the even worse utopianism of Marxism, <laughs> right? The even scarier, like kind of there's a point in uh, breaking up and disrupting and you know shaking up a little bit the kind of innocuous utopianism of you know I don't know what alternative medicine and <laughs> this kind of stuff. <laughs> um, and you know, you know, let's at least get a heartbeat in this in this mother. You know, like let's have some scary utopianism. You know, Marxism. You know, Marxism will put like the fear of God in you at least a little bit. <coughs> no, because you know, because Marxism is scary for a reason. Marxism raises the questions. You know, it's scary because it doesn't allow you to think. Oh, I can preserve myself against the system. Me and my friends, you know, we can be nice to each other. We don't have to be capitalists. <laughs> um, and so, you know, the fact that Marxism is like, no, you're going to be a capitalist one way or the other. The best you can be is a little capitalist. You know, when, when you organize your labor union and fight the bosses, you're still acting out of capitalist self-interest. Deal with it. Um, Yeah, I mean, the, the guy that we interviewed in uh, the, the paper, Hal Foster, the postmodernist art critic, um, he, uh, he's an editor of the art journal October. And in that journal, he interviewed a, a collective, they're called the Retort Collective, it's T.J. Clark and other people, who wrote a book called The Afflicted Powers, the spectacle in the current age. It was about the 9-11, the post-9-11 world. And they got into a discussion in the pages of this October journal in which Hal Foster said, well, isn't there a danger, because T.J. Clark was raising like Benjamin and raising you know, these kinds of figures, even though Clark himself is not a Marxist, he's a situationist, he's an anarchist. Um, and Hal Foster said, well, isn't there a danger if you take the commodity form seriously the way Marx does, that you will just become enchanted with it and you'll just succumb to it? Right? Don't you need like something else? Don't you need to like break out of the commodity form? Like that if you have this dialectical approach to the commodity form, aren't you conceding to it? You know, aren't you allowing yourself to be subsumed by it? And the point is, we don't have a choice in that. You know, you can sort of trick yourself into thinking that there's some kind of choice to be outside of that, but there really isn't. And again, the kind of question that Hal Foster was raising betrayed, you know, a complete misunderstanding. He's like, oh, well, a dialectical approach to capital is going to be pro-capitalist, so we can't do that. It's like, well, of course it's going to be pro-capitalist because there's no other way of being. Right? That's what Adorno means when he says wrong life can't be li lived rightly. Right? He's saying there's no choice but to be an instrument of this system in one way or another. <coughs> and, you know, we have to deal with that. Um, yeah, the workers' movement is completely implicated and complicit with capitalism, absolutely. Right? But that's the best we can hope for. <laughs> or at least that's what Adorno says. That's right. In other words, how do we, you know, it's why, you know, we will sometimes with Platypus, like, you know, make these provocative statements about, like, you know, when Naomi Klein came to speak at the University of Chicago, she was a big anti neoliberal ideologue, right? Which Ideolo we hosted her. We right? hosted her, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, her critique of, here, let me back up a second. Naomi Klein can't sort of abide by the fact that the neoliberals were, had a point in understanding capitalism as a form of freedom. Like in other words, she can't abide the fact that 
you know, Milton Friedman was not just trying to line the pockets of rich people, you know, was not just interested in supporting like fascistic dictators like, uh, you know, Pinochet in Chile and whatever, but that he really thought he was serving the interests of human freedom and not in the kind of fascistic way. In other words, not understood as like, I don't know what, the Aryan race. He thought that like the people of Chile, the indigenous people of Chile, the non-white people of Chile would be better served by capitalism. Um, in other words, it wasn't like some kind of covert racism or anything like that. And you know, similarly support to, to you know, uh, authoritarian but pro-capitalist regimes throughout the world. And but, you know, she s couldn't acknowledge that, that there was sort of a point to that in any respect. I mean, of course, there's a point to criticizing that. Um, but, you know, she had to treat that as just sort of rank deception, as like a lie. Um, as opposed to certainly a lie in one respect, but the, the kernel of truth to it is what she couldn't abide. And I think that in that sense, right, like, you know, someone that we've worked with, a Unite Here organizer, Chuck Hendricks, you know, like, he'll be the first to tell you, yeah, labor unions are capitalist, absolutely. They are. They're, they're seeking after the, and he comes from an anarchist background, an anarcho-syndicalist background. He knows that the labor union organizing, the work he himself does, is not in itself anti-capitalist. Right? What he's decided is that he's gonna champion the interests of the workers against the bosses. Right? In other words, he's long since said, okay, yeah, I was this anarchist anti-capitalist and I realized how unrealistic that was because in the meantime, People are being exploited, people are starving, and so the workers have to assert themselves in their capitalist interests, that he was for that. You know, and he was doing whatever it took to advance that, even if it means working with Republican Party people because the Democrats are the ones in power, right? If, it, if working with the Republicans means opening you know, a window of opportunity for a labor union, he'll do that, right? He has done that. You know, um, basically, you know, the bottom line for him is are the workers' interests being advanced? And he knows that that's like a pro-capitalist position. He's fine with that, right? Because that's just real, like he's honest that way. Um, and, you know, again, it complicates what we mean by capitalism. Usually what people mean by capitalism is like, Corporate greed. Yeah, corporate greed, consumerism, materialism, you know, some kind of like, I don't know what, like objectification of things. Like, you know, it just sort of runs the gamut. Um, and, you know, there's an alternative to just whining about capitalism. Like that's again, the scary aspect of Marxism is that, you know, Marxism, because it understands itself, as trying to push capitalism in and through itself, beyond itself, people know that Marxists are serious, or at least could be serious. And they're pretty much happy that Marxists have become like the rest of the left, um, just these kind of ethical people right, who just complain. <coughs> but you know, or indict. Hmm? complain and indict others. Yeah, well, they denounce each other, sure. But that's just like sectarianism, which you'd find in anywhere. Like, in other well, words, if you go I into- mean also from like an ethical, mm -hmm. I mean, for instance, you talk about people who understand capitalism as, th there's the fact that certain sort of trends of thought, I mean, like you, a prime example of this was sort of throughout the 90s, the like sort of anti-globalization movement, you know, that there's a link between their understanding of capitalism and the form that their sort of protest against it takes, like when they, call it when they like say like oh you're a consumer whore when they like have to revert to like using the word whore as though like when you're buying something the problem is that you're giving up some like sacred virginity or something by buying something from like a corporation that's not like or buying something that's not like you know made by your friend or made by someone else or made by indigenous people somewhere here's a good example of this is benjamin the way people read benjamin's arcades project for those of you Walter Benjamin is this kind of very popular kind of figure in terms of cultural studies, literary criticism, etc. And the way Benjamin understood Baudelaire, Baudelaire compared himself as a poet to the prostitute, right? Understood himself as a prostitute and exalted prostitution as like the only honest 
you know, way that you can make a living um, in modernity. And what people have turned that into is some kind of ethical defense of the prostitute as some kind of victim of modern society, as opposed to what it really was, which is the endorsement of the prostitute as the most venal manifestation of compromised humanity in the face of capitalism. Right, and but it, again, people will twist it around. It's like, oh, well, Baudelaire. If anything, like the fact that Baudelaire cared about prostitutes. It's <laughs> like, no, that's not the point. The point that he Baudelaire liked the honest prostitutes as opposed to the myriad dishonest prostitutes that com, you know comprise the world, and liked the inhumanity of the condition of the prostitute. In other words, it was the inhumanity of prostitution that attracted Baudelaire, and that he saw as heroic. Right, and you know, why was Benjamin turned on to that? Because again, as as uh, in one of the quotations I had, inhumanity or dehumanization is also its opposite. Right, what appears to be dehumanizing about capitalism is also its emancipatory potential. Is also its promise, and so the ethical rejection of capitalism is oh, capitalism is dehumanizing. Well, it all depends on what you mean by the human. If you mean like the happy villager of traditional society, that's right, it is dehumanizing, thank God. Right? Um, and, you know, rather the question is, does it point beyond itself? In other words, are we just gonna be stuck in you know, this kind of liminal state of tearing up traditional society, but in favor of what? In other words, capitalism's promise over traditional society has not been realized. But that's the basis of, of a Marxian critique of, of capitalism, is that it hasn't made good on its own promises. It hasn't objectified or reified the world enough. <coughs> it's not that it's done it too much, it's that it hasn't completely done it. I mean, again, this raises all sorts of like deep questions, and you know, uh, my point here is just to say that Adorno is a good window into this kind of approach. Hmm. You know, uh, Adorno will be a good guy um, for grasping how the left, the Marxist left, historically kind of gave up its mission and became kind of confused, meaning started taking its own rhetoric seriously, mm. you know, and forgot what was behind it. Became vulgar. Or as Richard once put it, this is another, um, one of the godfathers of Platypus, <laughs> the mask became the real face. Because, you know, there was a lot of sloganeering in the 30s about the workers and the workers and the workers and you know, the good salt of the earth workers. And, you know, what people then forgot was that, well, the point wasn't just to assert the workers as such, right, but rather to critique, instigate, provoke, prod on the workers' movement with a kind of critical consciousness not just to sort of celebrate the workers, you know. More worker day. Yeah, like we don't, you know, like Marxism is hardly necessary if, you know, it's like the grapes of wrath kind of consciousness. Like, you know, you can, you can have that. You know, we need Marxism for that. Questions? Comment? Um, turn out the reading group. Yes. Um, the reading group this Saturday will be merging with um, SAIC because um, it's towards the end of the year and me and Carl need to sort of put some of the energy into school. Um, <laughs> so, um, this Saturday at um, 12, is it? 
one. 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 Okay. At one to four, SAIC will send out an email announcement. I added you to the reading group list. Okay. Um, so that would be cool. And I don't know if you can. We're reading Trotsky. Yes. The lessons of October. Yeah. From 1924. Yeah. Which I might have to go to a rehearsal. But. Mm -hmm. And if you plan on going, you have to contact someone to get your name on a list to be able to get into yeah, the Yeah, I mean, everyone here, I think, is because we're maybe not. But I put your email on. Okay. Yeah, you go to UChicago, right? Yeah, I, I go to Red Sox, too. Oh. Yeah. Um, do we want to go to Carmen's or Thai food or something? Oh, it's not popular. Maybe. Where's Thai food? Um, there would be... A couple locations. There's, there's the closest one is probably Sauce or Rock, but you'd have to go down to Grand Hill. What about... Um, what time does Chabuca close? I'm still not sure if they're open yet. They look like they're open, but they don't have a sign saying they're open. What kind of place is that? Uh, Indian, Indian food. food. Oh, really? Uh, oh. Indian food and then a fast food version of Indian food. They, they, they sell what basically comes out as Indian food burritos. And they're very nice. There's also, there's <laughs> Indian also food burritos. It's just like, there's also yeah. I printed a copy myself. Oh, you, you already have one? Uh, okay. Uh, that is a little. That is a little bit of the promise of capitalism. What is? Let's go. Let's do this. Oh yeah. Let's try Shibuka. Let's see if they're open. Because if they're open, I love. It might be Carmen's and the inevitable Carmen's. Habibi's. Well, how far is that? Wait, if we if we go to Carmen's, you're gonna order all our pizzas for us, Gabe? I'll I'll do that again. Um, it's close. It's like two blocks away. I don't trust. No, it's not. <laughs> Three blocks. No, it's, it's like two hundred miles. <laughs> it's not. It's, it's a it's a divan. Yeah. And Magnolia. Yeah. Magnolia. Magnolia okay, so it's like four Magnolia is a block west of Sheridan. Let's yeah. just walk down the middle of the avenue. Yeah. And oh, Habibi's is there. Yeah, that's not too bad then. And what is that? Middle Eastern is for That place creeps You're me in out. And <laughs> shawarma. Yeah, like that place? yeah Habib Habibi Habibi's is just like, I like that. Uh, home of some Ar Arabic uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm pushing for it's a front I for, for, for in there I'm pushing for Indian food. It's, it's, it's a front for Hamas. For Hamas? Then we should definitely go there. Let's go. And strap a suicide vest to you. Has this been recording this whole time? Yes. Oh, no.